Mmm, spicy. Screenwriter and producer, and uh, there's quite a bit of information in this book. Uh, it's not just about screenwriting, but all kinds of information about how to turn an idea or script uh, a book into a movie. And uh, there's 50 billion dollars worth of advice in this one book. Copies of which are available at our registers. Um, we thank you for being here tonight and supporting independent bookstores. Um, it means a lot to us to have you here and to welcome Mr. Marlowe. Hi, and thank you. Uh, well, as you said, $50 billion worth of advice. And that figure, at yours for $15.95. Bargain. Uh, $15.99. Well, that figure comes from the amount of money earned by the films of the people who were interviewed for and quoted in the book. And they've also racked up an impressive number of Academy Awards and nominations. So, a lot of people have a story they'd like to sell to Hollywood. It could be true life story, novel, comic book. These days it could even be a toy line, like Transformers. And with eight of the top 10, well over 50 of the top 100 <coughs> highest grossing films of all time being adaptations of one sort or another, there's never been a better time to pitch, sell an adaptation. But there's a catch. Hollywood doesn't care. There are 50,000 new screenplays registered every year with the Writers Guild of America. An equal or greater number are never registered but copyrighted instead, and probably a greater number than both of those combined are just never registered anywhere. Uh, that's just in America, and just the people who bother to write a screenplay. Many people who want to sell something to Hollywood have rights, they have an idea, they don't have a screenplay. So there's an even greater number of people out there. To tell the truth, most of those stories are unreadable. Most of those that aren't would be unwatchable. <coughs> so, and as far as Hollywood's concerned, who are you? You may just be another one of those guys. Odds are you are. So you have a story you want to sell to Hollywood. They don't care. They like the giant ancient tortoise in Neverending Story. They don't even care that they don't care. <laughs> So, your job is to make them care. You do that by showing them you understand their needs, because make no mistake, the people in Hollywood are not there to do favors for you, or to make money for you, or to put your story on the screen. They're there to make money for themselves. If you can help them do that, then they're interested. It's the Jerry Maguire approach. Help me help you. The way you do that is you show them you understand what they're looking for. And the first thing they're looking for is a brief, concise pitch. If you've seen Miles trying to explain his novel in Sideways, or Eddie in Limitless, they just go on and on and on, and they never get to the point of what the story's about. So when you get the opportunity to speak to or email someone in Hollywood, what they want is your story in 10 seconds or less. They want to know three things in that 10 seconds. They want to know who the story is about, what that character's goal is, and what the obstacle standing in the way of that goal is. That's all you have time for in 10 seconds. You, most of the time, you're not going to put in a character's name. These brilliant subplots get left out. Uh, you have the character, perhaps a defining characteristic about him, should be someone likable, someone identifiable. The goal should be something that people can get behind if the main character's goal is to save the life of someone would rather see dead, that's not going to work. Uh, and then you need an obstacle that isn't a walk in the park, something that present, prevents, sorry, presents a serious challenge to the character. And lest you doubt that this can be done, uh, the logline for The Fugitive would be, I'm going to try to do it without looking at my book, oh, 
A fugitive doctor wrongly convicted of killing his wife goes on the run, struggles to prove his innocence while pursued by a relentless U.S. Marshal. A fugitive doctor wrongly convicted of killing his wife, that's your who, struggles to prove his innocence, that's his goal, which by the way will also catch his wife's killer because that's part of the goal, it's implied. And the obstacle is clearly the relentless U.S. Marshal who's out to get him. That's the story in 10 seconds or less. A few others, and now I will cheat, would be. Oh, an emotionally shuttered Wall Street tycoon hires a vivacious hooker for the week, falls in love, and struggles to forge his first meaningful relationship, which would be Pretty Woman. A family struggles to escape a remote island park whose main attractions, genetically restored dinosaurs, have been set loose by a power failure, Jurassic Park. You can even get a relatively complicated concept across, such as Minority Report. If you just went in with a cop convicted of a future murder goes on the run to prove his innocence. People are going to say, what? That doesn't make any sense. So you need a setup line, and you only do this with a relatively complex concept. Which would be, in a society where criminals are arrested before their crimes are committed, a cop convicted of a future murder goes on the run to prove his innocence. Also in 10 seconds or less. So there are very few concepts you can't get across in 10 seconds. Uh, another thing Hollywood wants, and this fits into the 10 second pitch is a classically structured story. 90, 95% or more of all commercially successful films are classically structured, which means three acts and seven basic plot points, which is a lot to keep track of, but hey, it's in here. Also, the first few chapters are online at makeyourstorymovie.com, as well as some supplementary materials, updated things, lists in the book that need to be updated. The seven things would be an inciting incident, which is the thing that comes along and turns your main character's life upside down, after which his life is never going to be the same. In a screenplay that is page 10 to 15, you're basically 10% of the way in, 10 to 15% of the way in. The first act turn is when your main character realizes what his goal is, what it is he must do, and takes some action toward the achievement of that goal. He knows what it is, sets out to do it. Just deciding what it is or realizing what it is is passive. It doesn't entail any action on his part. He needs something dynamic. So it's a decision coupled with an action. At the, in a screenplay, that's what you want to hit on page 30. Uh, and these same, the same progression of plot points applies to novels as well, but you have a lot more leeway with just where these things are going to be placed in the novel because you don't have a Hollywood reader saying, you didn't hit this on page 30. Ah, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> Around the middle of the story is your midpoint, which can be one of two things. It can be where you realize that there's some as heretofore unexpected element going on in the story. Something you weren't aware of is happening in the background. Or it can be a no turning back point for the main character. Some point of no return, some action that can't be undone will have horrible consequences if not successful. Or you can sometimes have both of these in a single story. Uh, particularly if you have dual storylines, which is somewhat complicated but can be done. Up in the Air has this. You've got his business storyline and you've got his relationship storyline. And each of them has every one of these plot points as it goes along. And at the end, one ends up, the other ends down. Uh, after the midpoint, you have the low point. This is the all hope is lost point. If there were a place where your main character were going to commit suicide, this would be it. Uh, it seems like he's as far as it's possible to get from achieving his or her goal. There's no way to get there, and that's the low point. Followed swiftly, so readers and viewers don't get depressed, by the second act turn, which is when the hero or main character comes up with a new plan in pursuit of the goal and sets out to execute that plan, and perhaps execute the villain in some cases. After this, we have, of course, the climax, which can be brief, can be long, uh, this, everything should escalate toward this. This is when, the classically, the hero meets the villain, or the hero confronts the obstacle. If that's not a person or a creature, uh, it could sometimes be something internal, though that's rare these days. Uh, whatever it is must confront the obstacle, and at the end of the climax, he either succeeds or fails in achieving his goal. Typically, in American film, if he fails, he gets something better. Like, if there's this thing that he wanted, 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 and he fails to get it, then maybe he gets the girl instead. 
So he comes away with something of more value. But most of the time, the hero achieves the goal. After the climax is the wrap-up, which is very brief. These days, it can be uh, as brief as, Yo, Adrian! I love you! <laughs> End of film. Fight's over, that's the climax, and then you've got her rushing, to the, rushing into the ring. They hug, that's it. In fairy tales, it's even briefer. It's, and they lived happily ever after. That's your wrap-up. That's all there is. Okay, so they want to know that you understand the structure, and they worry if you can't, because if it hasn't got the structure, it makes it very difficult to boil that into a log line, which is your 10-second <coughs> concept pitch. And if you can't get the story across in 10 seconds, folks in Hollywood start to fear that they won't be able to convey what the story is about in a 30-second trailer. And if they can't do that, they're not going to make any money. Also, if you find in trying to condense your story into this 10-second pitch, which is the first thing that they should hear or read, and you find you can't, it could mean one of two things. It could mean you suck at log lines, which most people do when they start out, and that doesn't mean you can't write an excellent story because they're two completely different skills. Some people can write a fabulous story, they can't boil it down to 10 seconds, 10 seconds to save their lives. Others can do both. The other thing it could mean, which is at least a 50% chance, is that you can't boil it down to those three elements because one or more of those elements is actually not present in your story. That means you have to go back to the story and you have to make sure that element is there if you're looking to sell Hollywood because they want classically structured stories that can be boiled down and pitched very briefly. If they like your pitch, then they'll ask to hear a little more. And so you prepare a one-minute pitch, which gives them a bit more. Sometimes they'll just ask to see if you have a screenplay, your screenplay. Or they want to hear a little more, then you give them the one-second pitch, which is covered in here. Sorry, one minute. 60-second pitch. Once you've got all that, if the story is both good and appropriate to their needs, you're in business. Now, some people want to sell rights to their story, their life story, a book, rather than selling a screenplay. This can be done, it is a harder sell, and most of the time, if you're not already hugely well-known, hugely successful, already have a built-in audience they know they can take advantage of, you're going to get paid a lot less for the rights than you are for a finished screenplay. Because one of the guys interviewed the book, he puts it to uh, Michael Nozick, who's been up for an Oscar as best producer, he's Paul Haggis's producing partner. I don't know if that how many film people there are here, but Haggis was up for five Academy Awards in three years as writer, director, producer. He says, what Hollywood wants is you to get them as close to the end zone as possible. A finished script puts them in the end zone. They can look at it, they don't have to worry about how are we going to get a 300-page book down to a 120-page screenplay. Uh, we need fewer characters. Characters need to be condensed. This guy has to be more likable. Can we do that? Uh, can we bring the budget down to something we can afford? And if they look at a book, they don't know. They have to spend time, they have to spend money to get somebody to write that story. If they feel that it's, it's close enough, as it is, to warrant that expense. And then they're going to pay that guy who writes the screenplay probably a lot more than they're paying you for the book or the rights to your story. And that writer will not be sharing that money with you. So if it's possible, for you to write the screenplay yourself, or with help from someone who is already familiar with writing screenplays, or even if you want to hire somebody else to write it for you, just make sure you own it when you're done. It's, you know, it's your screenplay, they just wrote it. They would get credit, maybe they get a piece of the action, but it's your screenplay to sell, not theirs. Then you have, you get them to the end zone. And once you're there, they feel more comfortable. They said, this is something, we can make. This is something we can believe in, we can take to investors and say, look at this, you know, we want your money. Or to a director or an actor, say, are you interested in this? And they say yes. And they don't have to convince the actor or the director to read a book. They can just read a screenplay instead. And often they just skip to the parts that include them. Can't do that with a book. So, once you do that, you're in business. Uh, how much did they pay is a frequent question. Options, which is typically what you'll get when you're trying to sell the rights, could be anywhere from a dollar to several thousand dollars for an unknown property. Uh, could even go 10,000 or higher occasionally if you know, it's a reasonably successful property or well-known. 
And the way you get a well-known story is you do something heroic or incredibly stupid, and you get yourself on national TV. Uh, a good one is getting lost in a blizzard. That always, that always brings somebody a movie deal every couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> something you can't expect to survive, unfortunately. It's like winning a Congressional Medal of Honor. No reasonable person could expect to get out of that alive, so you can't really plan on it. But if you should do something incredibly heroic or incredibly stupid, Hollywood may come to you. It happens. They see you on every newscast. Uh, they could say, hey, you know, let's make a movie out of that. But short of that, you need to get them to the end zone with a screenplay, hopefully, or an absolutely brilliant pitch. If you have a book, that's better than just a pitch alone. Screenplay is best. Uh, the money they will spend if you have a screenplay. Uh, in New York, publishers will pay for a book from an unknown first book between ten and twenty thousand dollar advance. Uh, these days, it's even been sliding down. In Hollywood, an unknown screenwriter or someone with a screenplay to sell who is unknown will typically get between three hundred and six hundred thousand dollars. Now, usually you only get half of that up front. If and when they ever make the movie, you get the other half. Still, it beats the hell out of a typical book advance. Now, if you're J.K. Rowling and you've got Harry Potter, it's different. Uh, it can be different for first-time screenwriters. Just as in New York, occasionally a book from an unknown will sell high. Uh, this can also happen in Hollywood. A couple of the people I talked to for the book, one, Evan Doherty, the first script he sold was Snow White and the Huntsman, which got into a bidding situation. Several studios wanted it, so he's not just locked into one buyer. He's, well, we'll give you this, take it or leave it. And he got $3.5 million for the first script he ever sold. Not only that, but they were so interested that he could start dictating terms. And he said, uh, or his, more properly, his producer and his attorney said, if this film doesn't start shooting in, I believe it was 18 months, then we get the rights back, sell it to someone else, and we keep the money. Hmm. And they said, okay, because they wanted it that badly. Another guy, Bill Marsilli, first screenplay he sold, sold for $5 million. To be fair, however, he co-wrote this with Terry Rossio, who has written all of the Pirates movies, Zorro, Shrek, Men in Black, on and on and on. So that probably has something to do with the high price. What, what was the title? Deja Vu, which came out with Denzel Washington. Washington. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> there was not even a bidding situation on this. They, they took it in to Jerry Bruckheimer's company, which has done Armageddon and lots of yeah. big budget action pictures. And they said, hey, you know, would you maybe want buy this script? And they came back and said, well, okay, we'll give you $5 million. <laughs> but don't show it to anybody else. There were no bids. That was it. And as Bill says, the only reason he can think of that anyone would do that is because they read the script and they thought, someone else would pay six. <laughs> and they say, if we don't buy this for five million, mm -hmm. we're going to have to pay six because it's going to be a bidding situation. Wow. And they said, well, yeah, yeah, we'll take it. And they did. And it was a pretty successful movie. Now, you can't count on that happening, of course. Uh, but even if you get an average sale, 300 to 600 grand is not bad. Oh, now I'm going to cheat and I'm going to look at my book. Can I ask a question? Sure. That three to six, is that strictly big Hollywood movies? What about independent movies? It depends on who's buying. Uh, good question. If you're, if you're, obviously if you're writing something and it's a movie that's going to be shot for a million dollars, you know, paying a third of that, a half of that for the screenplay, yep isn't going to work out. Uh, on the other hand, uh, independent project I have rolling right now, if uh, they get the money together, it would be about 60 million bucks, uh, could have a movie in the next year or two. Uh, based on a comic, by the way, or comic script. But the point is, independents aren't always cheap. Uh, they top out right now at 60 to 80 million dollars uh, for independently funded films. They just can't seem to raise any more money. Unless it's someone like George Lucas, who's just got his own money and makes his own film. Yeah. And even he's tired of that now. Uh, if you're talking something like Saw, Hard Candy, both of which were shot for a million, million two in that range, uh, then no, you're not going to get uh, 300 to 600,000 for the script <coughs> up front. Now, you may cut a deal with them for back end, yeah. saying, give me you know, 50,000 for the script, 100,000, whatever you can get, if they're really wild about it. But also, I want some money on the back end if the film does well. You know, a percentage of the gross or adjusted gross 
Uh, you can sometimes make that deal with smaller producers who are doing smaller films because they don't have anybody looking over their shoulder at that point to say, hey, you can't do that, or we're not going to do this. They can promise anything they want, you get it in writing, and the contract is good, then if it's successful, you could do well, you could do even much better than a standard deal with a studio. Right. Uh, if you happen to write books and you want to sell a screenplay as well, you should, you should keep with the books. You shouldn't give it up and just switch to screenplays. Also, if you're wondering which way to go, I don't know how many people are book authors here, how many are screenwriters, uh, there's an odd dynamic at work, and that is there are no pure screenwriters who make anywhere near what the highest paid novelists make. But the highest paid novelists, without exception, have heavy film involvement. So what happens is this. No matter how much you get paid for your screenplay, even if you get paid $5 million, there is a cap on what you will be paid for the screenplay. You will not get a percentage of the gross, unless you're J.K. Rowling. Uh, you will get that amount, no more. It doesn't matter if the film makes $3 billion, like James Cameron's Avatar. Uh, actually, with DVD sales, it's more like $15 million. But it doesn't matter. You'll get that $5 million, no more. You may get bonuses, residuals, that kind of thing, but that's it. The money stops for you. The studio gets paid forever, but for you, the money stops. If, however, it's based on a book, what happens is a successful movie drives up the sale of the books. You get paid for every single book that's sold because that's how publishers work. You yep. get a royalty on every copy. So even if you get five million bucks for a screenplay, if that sells 10 million books, there's another seven, 10 million bucks, depending on what you deal with. Not to mention spin-off sequels and so forth. Uh, another thing is uh, in Hollywood when they make a movie, when they buy the rights, they buy the right to make sequels. That doesn't mean they can make a movie out of every one of your book sequels. You continue to make book sequels, if you like, but they can spin the movie sequels off from the first movie in any way they like. If they want to base a movie on one of your sequel books, they have to come back and they have to do a different deal for that. If they just spin off sequels from the movie, they don't, but they do have to pay you again. Since it's in your contract, you have a good attorney every time you get paid which is one thing you should not overlook. If you get serious about Hollywood, or I should say Hollywood gets serious about you, you need an entertainment attorney. Uncle Elmer, who went to law school, will not suffice. <laughs> uh, there are people who have tried that and they've gotten into such bad trouble. These people have been in this business for decades, the best of them. The attorneys, some of them get paid $1,500 an hour. Uh, but you don't have to pay that because a lot of them will work on contingency. If you have a deal on the table and you know it's money to be made, they will work for typically 5%. So they will do the contract work, negotiations, up front for free. When you get paid, they get 5% of what you get. And that is a good deal to make because you, you will not survive a negotiation with a studio in good shape without an entertainment attorney who knows all the tricks in the book. Uh, you don't want someone who's just started out, you want someone who's been in the business for quite a while. Greenberg Glusker is an excellent firm. They represent uh, James Cameron, Tom Cruise, uh, me. Uh, I was surprised to find out they uh, represented those people, actually. But uh, my first screenplay deal, uh, I went to them because I'd heard good things about them, and I said, you know, this is the deal that's on the table. Uh, I'm not going to pay you 1500 bucks an hour or 650 or whatever that particular attorney's charging. Uh, and they said, we'll do it for 5%. Actually, they said, we'll do it for 10%. Cool. <laughs> and I said, hey, what about this 5%? I said, well, <coughs> after the first one, we'll do it for 5% after that. But the first one, 10%. So I said, okay. okay. So I didn't have an agent or a manager to pay on that deal, so it wasn't such a, a hard bite to take. So you want an entertainment attorney. Uh, a book that can educate you tremendously on the subject is called The Screenwriter's Legal Guide. Yeah, by Stephen Breimer, B R E I M E R, who works for a firm that keeps changing his name. Last time I checked, it was Bloom, Hergo, Deemer, and about five other guys. Uh, but that is an excellent book. It was written a while ago, but this guy knows all of the tricks. Not too many more have been invented since then. You go through that, you'll have an excellent understanding of the process and also of why you need someone like that to negotiate your contract. Agents will negotiate a deal, 
but they're typically not all that interested in things that aren't going to make them money. Whereas if you've got a book, comic book, whatever, an underlying property, you have rights you want to preserve in that to make you money doing other things that have nothing to do with what this agent is going to make money off of. He's going to make money off the movie, off sequels, maybe spin-offs from the movie, TV series. You sell books, you sell comic books, do a stage play. He's not going to make a dime off of that unless he's part of the negotiation. So he tends not to be all that interested in retaining those rights for you. Entertainment attorney, they're going to make money off everything you do. So it's sort of enlightened self-interest. Once again, Jerry Maguire, help me help you. I don't know how much time I have left here. How am I doing? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I need to buzz through something rather quickly here that's covered in more detail in the book. And that is, there are 12 things that Hollywood is looking for. Actually, 13, but 12 things Hollywood wants sounds better. And that's one of the chapters in the book. So I'm just going to buzz through those kind of briefly. And each one has its own chapter in the book. Hollywood wants a pitchable concept, which we covered, logline, get that story across in 10 seconds or less. A relatable hero, or one with whom the reader can sympathize or empathize, or at least finds compelling in some way. If people don't care about your characters, they don't care what happens to them. Think about reading or seeing a news report about a terrible accident. People hurt, people killed, and you think, oh, those poor people. Ten seconds later, you're thinking about your next cheeseburger. This doesn't mean that you're insensitive. It's just a coping mechanism. If you got emotionally involved in all of those things, you'd go crazy. Now, you find out later, someone you care about was in that same accident. All of a sudden, your reaction is completely different. You can think about nothing else. You've got to know what happened to them. Where are they? Can you see them? Uh, you, your mind is just locked on that. You're focused on that. That's what you need to do with your story. Characters have to be someone the reader cares about and eventually the viewer. The difference is you're now emotionally invested in the outcome of that accident or that story. You need to know what happened, so you need to turn the page. An emotionally compelling story, because in the end a relatable hero is not quite enough. The most engaging character in the world will soon be boring if she has nothing emotionally meaningful to do. They must have skin in the game. There must be some kind of stakes. If you've got someone who's out to save the world, that's okay, that's good, it's relatable, but let's say hey, there's a bomb that's going to destroy New York City. Now, okay, they want to save New York City, but if their wife or their child is somewhere in the city and can't get out before that bomb goes off, now it's personal. Uh, they have emotionally compelling stakes. It's not just save a bunch of strangers, it's save someone they've come to care about, and if it's well written, well shot, someone you will come to care about. Ticking clock. Uh, lends immediacy to the story. No ticking clock means no hurry, no urgency to get anything done. That in turn makes for a boring story, or worse, no story at all. Taking the example of the bomb in New York. You can have a pitch about a story where, where your hero must save New York, uh, must, must, uh, let's see, let's say your hero must stop a bomb from going off before it destroys New York City at some point in the future. There's no urgency there. It could be this year, it could be 10 years from now. There's no hurry. Now, if he needs to save New York City from a bomb that goes off at midnight, now you're in a hurry. You've got a ticking clock. You can actually see how much time he's got left. Now, a, a missed cab, a dropped phone call, any delay could be fatal, not just for him, not just for his loved ones, but for the entire city. Now you've got a ticking clock rolling. Strong visual potential, a story whose main events can be depicted visually on the screen. Internal books often make for lousy movies. Mm -hmm. uh, an internal book can be a fabulous read, can be magnificent, but can you put it on the screen? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, no. Another reason why it's better to go in with a screenplay if you can, because particularly with an internal book, they look at it and think, how are we going to make this into a movie? You show them, you do it for them. Uh, there are some films lately that have taken an interesting approach. Action films, um, they have taken things that are internal and portrayed them as if they were external. Inception being an excellent example. Uh, going back a little bit, Matrix. Everything that's happening in these movies is technically happening inside the characters' minds, almost everything. And yet we see it as if it's happening before us. There's something to point a camera at. 
You have someone who's just got a lot of internal angst about something, you can get inside their head in a book, you can describe what they're feeling. You can't do that in a movie. You need something to put in front of the camera. Classical structure, we covered that. Three acts, seven plot points. An actor-friendly lead role. A book, you don't have to worry about that. The people want to read it. But now you need to get somebody else interested in your story. Because for the most part, studio green lights hinge on actor, sometimes director participation. So you need somebody who can bring in an audience to get interested in your film, unless it's a very small budget film, in which case more chances. Studios, they want to see somebody who's going to make them some money. Because even if they believe in your story, they want a face people recognize on the screen. It helps in the trailer. Uh, average length for a screenplay, 105 to 120 minutes or thereabouts. Time is money. First timers do not warrant exceptions. When you're writing a book, you can show two characters having tea in a park, and it costs the same for the publisher as showing someone blowing up a planet. A page is a page. The ink costs what it costs. In a movie, showing two characters having tea in a park might run $200,000. Blowing up a planet might run five or ten million. You can't have too many of those scenes in a movie that's going to cost a reasonable amount. James Cameron accepted. Oh, reasonable budget that comes under. Low fat story. Everything in the story has to be there for a reason, other than being one of the writer's favorite scenes. Uh, there's an old saying in Hollywood, if you show a shotgun over the mantle in the first act, you damn well better use it in the third. Examples of this, uh, two from James Cameron films, being the most successful filmmaker of all time. If you remember Aliens, in the beginning, you see Ripley using this power loader to, I believe she was moving crates. Someone else was using it to load missiles. And later, she uses the same device in the third act to battle the alien queen, because she's not strong enough to do it herself. So she uses this tremendously strong power loader. Uh, upgrading that in Avatar, we see Colonel Quartz near the beginning. And he's kind of doing his boxing moves in a sort of modified power loader, this huge combat suit, mechanical suit. In the third act, he uses it to survive a ship crash <coughs> and battle the Thanator and Neytiri. And we set that up in the first act, and then it pays off in the third act. Another thing we see early in Avatar is the legend of, if I remember correctly, Toruk Mal. We see the big dragon skeleton. In the third act, surprise, there's Toruk Mal flying through the sky. So nothing is wasted. Everything's there for a reason. Franchise potential. This you don't need in all films. The more expensive the film project is going to be, the more you want to have this. If a studio sees that it's not just a one shot, everybody dies in the end, Titanic, for example. Again, Cameron's an exception to everything. But he's earned that over many years with many hits. This is where James Cameron lives and breathes and why he's so successful. Hollywood divides audiences into four quadrants, four sections. Young female, older female, young male, older male. That's very complicated, but that's the way they do it. If you have something that appeals to all of those people, that screams hit, and that's what Cameron does lately. You know, he started out with Terminator, uh, True Lies, Abyss, Aliens, things like that. Now, Titanic, Avatar, he's doing things that appeal to people who are 8 to 80, and they come back and see it multiple times. And then they go to pay it and see it in 3D. And then they buy the DVD. Again, if you're not doing things that are horribly expensive, you don't need that. Uh, you can do a little movie that appeals to one quadrant. It doesn't matter. There are enough of those people to make that investment pay off for whoever's funding the film. Another thing you want typically at higher budget levels, doesn't matter at all at lower budget levels, is merchandising potential. If it can be made into a Happy Meal, the studio's happy. Uh, if they can do little action figures and lunch boxes and Halloween costumes, that makes them happier. Studios often make more from merchandising than they do from the films themselves. And if you want to keep a cinematic juggernaut like the Batman franchise running, you need to have that. And that again is 13 things, but 12 things Hollywood wants it sounds better. There's a lot more in here, much more than I can ever say tonight. And hey, if you want to know more, ask me questions or get the book. Right. Any questions? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I was talking to one guy one time. He said that a lot of the screenplays are written for um, 
some of, some of the big actors that are around. Like somebody would 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 sort of angle the screenplay toward a certain actor. That, that mm -hmm. that's one one way to. If you found that in your experience, in often writing. that happens after the script is sold because then they get an actor attached, and then it starts being sort of customized for that actor. Uh, if you're going to approach actors, and uh, many actors have production companies, their own company that looks for material for them to star in, uh, then you might do that before the sale. But the more you tailor it for that one actor, the less likely it is to be right for anyone else. So you might wind up with multiple versions of the script that way. But uh, that is one approach you can take if you're going to target an actor rather than a studio, for example. Then, sure, you can do that. And some of these uh, larger actors, they actually have their own writers, and, you know, they, or their favorite writers. You know, they do other things as well. But if uh, Julia Roberts is going to do a film, Ron Bass is going to have his hands on that script at some point. And you know, they have their favorite writers, and then those writers will come in and do exactly what you're talking about, tailor it for that actor, do lines for that actor. But uh, one of the people I interviewed for the book, uh, Leslie Dixon, one of the few A-list female screenwriters, uh, she says that a, a way that is often overlooked into the industry is going for an actor with your project because uh, if it's the right actor, they can get a film made by themselves. They can take the script to a studio, a production company, and say, you know what, I want to be in this. And if it's Bruce Willis, that Russell Crowe, it's probably going to get done. If it's not horribly expensive. Sometimes, even if it is. Any other questions? I'm here for you. Is it passe to, uh, as an adjunct to your log line, to say, this is Spinal Tap meets Leaving Las Vegas? Is that, is that huh. by the way? It's not passe. That's, that's another approach to take. Um, and it can be successful. Uh, it, must, it must be hit A meets hit B. Right. You don't want to throw a clunker right. in there. Even if it's right. an excellent movie, if it didn't right. make any money, Hollywood doesn't care. Right. Um, you can do that. Or you can do that in addition to your log line. If you're going to do that, I would say you do it in addition. Unless you've only got three seconds, then <laughs> use that. But it also relies on <coughs> things other people have done, and it's sort of, instead of extolling the virtues of your own story, it's saying, it's like this, and it's like that. You know, it's a purely commercial pitch. It's yeah. saying, it's like this hit meets that hit. And sometimes that doesn't make any sense. Um, Jonathan Hensley, one of the people I interviewed for the book, he wrote Armageddon and many other things. Uh, he says, and <laughs> if exactly this issue we were talking about, he said, people came to him with that, he'd say, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what that means. He said, you're a writer. You're paid to craft words. Go away, come back, and tell me in coherent sentences what this story is about. So you might run into that reaction. Yeah. Uh, I was just on the site. I just finished my twelfth script, oh. and I, I'm looking for representation. Mm -hmm. And I was this one. I can't remember his name. He's a big time uh, agent or manager. And everything you have to, you know, it, everything's on the site. And it says it lists list two movies. What this, what your screenplay mm -hmm. is similar to. I, well, you if know, they're asking I, for it, do it. It's like I can't even. I couldn't even think of one. I mean, I you know, <laughs> try to write original material. It's like I can't compare it to anything, so I left it blank. Haven't heard back from him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that may not have mattered. I mean, most yeah. in in New York, if a publisher is not interested, typically, eventually, they'll get back to you and say, you know, not quite right for us, or, yeah. or, or go sell shoes, depending. Right. Um, Hollywood, they're not interested. You just typically never hear back, right? Unless they have some connection to you, already know you, and so, you know, they want to see future things from you. If they're impressed and it's not right for them, they may say, you know, what else have you got? That's a very common into the industry. They see something, they're impressed by it, it's not right for them for whatever reason, but they're impressed enough to say, what else have you got? Right. I want to see you next time. Don't ignore that if it happens, because uh, they don't say it if they don't mean it. Do you have a question? Have you ever been involved in developing a screen screenplay into a book? Screenplay into Started a book? This, yeah. Oh, well, I... I haven't told my publisher, but actually, <laughs> I started writing uh, my first novel and first screenplay at the same time, and I finished the screenplay first, and then I referred to the screenplay while finishing the novel. Does that count? <laughs> Sounds like it. I'm just wondering if you have any, any much, or thoughts about it's kind of the reverse. It's much more difficult to go that way. Um, yeah. To begin with, very few people do both. Uh, 
Paul Haggis, just mm -hmm. Oscars out of his ears, says <laughs> that uh, he would never even try to write a book because he would be no good at it. It's, it's like they are opposite skills. Everything that makes you a good novelist makes for a lousy screenwriter or vice versa. Novels are about depth and richness and texture and screenplays are about saying things with maximum economy. You want to get the most across in the smallest possible number of words. And it's, it's easier to expand from a screenplay to a novel because you can expand on things. You can flush them out. When you go the other way from a novel to a screenplay, you have to lose things. And they're going to be things you like. And there's just no room for them. Things are going to have to go out the window. Characters are going to have to be condensed. Multiple characters are Subplots will have to be lost because you just don't have that kind of time in a movie. You, so it can go both ways. Uh, the one way is harder than the other, but they're both hard. Um, let's say you finish your projects, like your book or your screenplay, and you don't really know anybody. So mm -hmm. Where exactly do you start submitting stuff? Do you start going online and emailing people? Well, it's going to depend on what you have. Uh, as Charlie Rossio is probably the highest paid screenwriter in history, certainly the highest grossing, uh, has said the, the most idiotic approach will work if the script is genius. Uh, the most brilliant approach in the world will not work if the script is garbage. Um, so it depends on what you have. If you have something that's really, you know, oh my goodness, stunning, <coughs> uh, you're going to get representation. You send it to people, and one of those people fairly quickly is going to grab it if it is both good and commercial. You can have something that's excellent but not commercial, and that's going to tend not to interest most of the people in Hollywood because they're there to make money. Uh, some of them have made so much money that now they do things once in a while they don't expect to make any money off of because they want to make this film. Uh, those people are harder to find. Uh, it depends on what you have. Uh, first shot, go for managers. Managers are typically easier to approach, easier to get than agents. doesn't mean they're good. It uh, doesn't mean they're easy, but they're easier. Agents want something they can sell today or tomorrow. A manager might take a longer term approach if it's almost there. He might work with you to get it there. Agents, for the most part, can't be bothered. Uh, often it is a manager who will get you an agent because it's been pre-screened. The manager says, you know, this is ready to go, and the agent believes it. Whereas you know, 50,000 people send a guy a script and say it's ready, and he tends not to believe it. So he has a bunch of other people read it. And you know they are, they are assistants and people who want to move up, and they do that by recognizing good material. They want to like your material, they really do, because that's why they're there. They can't make any money if they don't like anybody's script. Um, I would go for an agent first if you can get some uh, professional feedback on it before you do that, because you don't want to make some mistake or omission <coughs> that you don't know about. Uh, you want someone who has a commercial sensibility to take a look at it. Uh, review it for you, tell you what the strong points are, the weak points, because you want it to be as strong as possible when you go out. You want to make the best first impression, because your first impression may be your last, if it's not a good impression. Uh, if everything goes really poorly and nobody ever gets back to you, uh, look at how to improve the script, again, preferably with some kind of uh, professional guidance, and go out again, maybe the next year, with a different title, and a different author name on the script. So people don't look it up on their computer and say, oh, we read this before in past time. Uh, that can work. If you wait five years and all the people have changed at the companies, you can go in with the same name and title. Sometimes they don't bother on you. But in case they do, different name, different title is one gambit. Can you put James Cameron as the, the different name? <laughs> that work? You could try that. What's something that's excellent for not, for not commercial? Um, Arthouse. What's that? Arthouse. Well, there are films that aren't necessarily art house films, but are still extremely good. Um, and there are films that don't make a lot of money, but they don't have to because they didn't cost much. Hard Candy, for example, made, I think, $50 million. It's a fabulous film. Yeah, but it only cost $1.2, $1.3. It was shot in the producer's house to save money. Hmm. And the whole thing takes place, except for one scene, uh, except two scenes, inside his house or immediately around his house. So that film didn't have to make a whole lot of money. Um, something like Age of Innocence, beautiful film. I don't know offhand how much money it made, but I wouldn't expect that to make money. Uh, 
if it made money, I wouldn't expect it to make a lot. Perhaps in DVD is where it travels, but it's not something that you put a trailer out for and people are, oh my god, I have to see that. But it's a beautiful film. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that can be a beautiful film and doesn't scream commercial. Uh, what's your view of long-term um, happenings in the business? Because basically we've lost television. Television used to have all these great dr dramatic shows on westerns and... Cable still does. Yeah, but there's there's so many reality shows now <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, there's just this whole batch of shows that we that used to need scripts and mm -hmm. now there are, you know, that those whole genres are, a lot of them are gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see that sliding more toward uh, uh, yeah, these reality type <laughs> things, yeah, or do you think that some of that might come back in the future? Or uh, I see cable as pretty strong. I mean, you've got uh, shows like Dexter going on what, season six, season seven now. Uh, it's one of my favorite series. I mean, it's also one of the best adaptations I've ever seen uh, from the books. Uh, you've got Game of Thrones. Uh, if you ask me, the first episode or two or a little, you know, weren't, didn't really grab you, but. You get past that, it's just excellent. Uh, the best TV is now cable, and they've got serious stuff with excellent character development because they have a year to get that character across. They don't have to get it across in two hours. And sometimes they can be much deeper than theatrical release films. Also, it's cheaper to get character across than it is to show big action, another reason why TV uh, kind of dominates in that area. And if you do a good deal of TV, it can make you more money than theatrical. It's harder to get into TV, though. So, you know, there's plus and minus. Uh, reality shows? Mm. <laughs> sure. Can you tell me, uh, with screenplay writing, how much, can you guide me through your outlining process, how much time you spend, you spend if you do, on an outline versus first draft? Oh, the more time you spend on the outline, the less time you'll spend on the first draft. Um, Nobody wants to outline. I resisted it for years. Uh, but when you know what you're going to write, you don't wind up stopping and wondering for three days how you're going to get your character out of the situation you painted him into. There is uh, several chapters in the book that go into the whole process from uh, the concept, the log line, to the one-page pitch, to the outline. You want to do an outline, preferably, and there's some stuff on the website on this as well, makeyourstorymovie.com. Uh, a digital outline. You don't want to go uh, one, two, three, A, B, C, and all of this stuff because you want to change anything, it's a mess. You just want to have one bullet point, and in that bullet point, you want to cover the important events that are emotional, physical, or spiritual, important stuff that matters in the story. And you cover a couple of things for one scene and one bullet point, then you move to the next bullet point. That way, if you want to delete anything, you just disappear it. If you want to move it, you copy and paste. If you want to save the old stuff to see what used to be there, you make it a different color or you strike it out. Uh, entirely new stuff, you just put in where, where it seems to work. If it doesn't work there, then you move it somewhere else. And when you have this outline, you can go through this outline <coughs> in 20 minutes, uh, most an hour, and see everything in the story. The advantage to this is when you've got a book or even a screenplay, if you want to change something and you want to see what other things that is going to ripple out into and also affect, you have to go through the whole damn thing. And if you rely on your memory, you might forget some things that it changes, and you can screw yourself over royally. If you have the outline, it's very easy to go down the bullet points and say, oh, it changes this, changes this, can I do it, can I not, I can move this, I can move that. It just makes the whole thing sort of digital mm -hmm. and much easier to do. Um, so you said you have a, a screenplay that's going to be made in the movie? Fingers crossed. Oh, fingers you crossed. never know until it's in the theater. So what was the process that you went through with that one? Oh, with that one, I had actually written that some time ago. It's based on a, uh, a comic book script. I'm still looking for an artist. I did the comic book script, and then I expanded it into a screenplay. And I was just getting into revising it with uh, a guy who used to be my manager, now a producer. And as we were starting to revise it, somebody else sold a pitch which is not an easy thing to do. Pitches don't sell that often these days. With a very similar concept, <laughs> which can absolutely sink you. Uh, you're working on something for years, and you've got to just write. Somebody goes out and sells something very much like it. It can kill you. Uh, but there was a difference in the situation in that this guy had sold a pitch, 
He, had, he did not have a script, and he'd never written a script before in his life. So we went out and made a deal for the entire script, because now the independent company that's got this project, if they get it moving fast, they're going to beat the hell out of the studio who's got to get this thing developed into a script, which they've now done, but they decided this guy can't write a script they like, so they tossed it and they hired somebody else, so now they're starting all over again. Meanwhile, this one's moving <coughs> forward with the indie. One advantage of independent production companies is they can move much faster than studio. If the studio doesn't have really putting the screws to them like Evan Doherty did, saying, make it in 18 months or we get the money back. And we sell it to someone else and they know there are you know, four other studios who want it. So there are, there are advantages both ways. Well, the disadvantage is the indies have to raise money. Uh, and sometimes that can be difficult. Studios, they have the money right there, ready to go. But they take their time. Most of the films that get bought, uh, most of the screenplays that get bought, never get made. But they get bought, they put money in your pocket, and sometimes you can get the rights back later, or you can get them transferred to another studio if this one just never gets around to making it. Yeah. Do you, in, in that situation, like I remember reading about one of the Fairley brothers for 10 years, he was a <laughs> successful screenwriter, uh -huh. but nothing was ever made. Can you still have... I mean, obviously, you can make a career out of that. It's a, it's a crapshoot if you're, if you're something that doesn't happen in the book world, yeah. right? So, can you still develop a reputation a as a as a great writer and just by selling and not having things made? Can you move up the food chain? You can because what happens is something that doesn't happen <clears throat> in the publishing world, and that is if uh, let's say you wrote something that's just absolutely brilliant, fabulous characters, for as an example. Could be fabulous action, whatever. Uh, but nobody thinks this film is going to make money. So it's not going to be made. But if they think the writing is fabulous, they may well then hire you to work on other projects they already have. Okay. For example, they have something they don't quite know how to get the characters right. Your character work is fabulous. And they say to you, we want you to work on this. And they pay very well for that. Uh, the Writers Guild minimum, once you're a member of the Guild, uh, is several thousand dollars a week. They can't pay you less than that. And it takes some time to complete these revisions. The Writers Guild minimum for a screenplay, by the way, is between sixty and $90,000, depending on the budget of the project. If it's over $5 million, then it's $90,000. But obviously, you rarely see anyone getting that amount because you go out with a spec script which is something you own, they have to buy it from you, and you're in that three hundred to 600000 grand park. If it's something where they come to you and hire you to write a script for them, then the figure is much lower, so <coughs> sixty to 90000 in the case of Writers Guild companies. Yeah. Is it a good idea to get into the Writers Guild? Or the yeah, but you have to sell something first. Yeah. You have to have a specific number of credits. Uh, I just wanted to... Is it possible to find an entertainment lawyer who's already established lots of relationships to work as a manager for you? Uh, I mean, if they like I, your stuff enough, or is that just I can't a, think of any offhand who have a reputation for that. There are managers and there are agents who are also attorneys, but they don't uh, live and breathe entertainment law. You know, typically they were an attorney first and right. then they became an agent or a manager. And I, I wouldn't rely on somebody who's a combination. Yeah. You know, all of the most uh, respected law firms are purely law firms. Right. Any others? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time and attention. That's yeah. great. Thank you. We have to put this out at the registers, and uh, if you want to come to the back desk, we can uh, get back there and you know, sign copies. Um,